Oh, yeah, sure. Let's applaud. Welcome back, everyone. Quick little break. Uh, so just a reminder for those of you that may have just entered into the space for questions, we do have a mic that's kind of in that, the back corner of the um, audience right back there, and we do need questions uh, spoken into the mic. So if you wouldn't mind queuing up at the Q&A time, that would uh, be very helpful. Uh, so our next panel is sure to inspire. Resist and Rise Up, a panel on activism, features authors who use their writing and their own unique voices to help call out oppression and amplify and illuminate the voices of others. Please join me in welcoming our panel, Hugh Ryan, author of The Women's House of Detention, A Queer History of a Forgotten Prison. Gwendolyn Keist, author of Reluctant Immortals. Julia Phillips, author of Disappearing Earth. Laquette, author of Jackson. And Mondion Dogon, author of Those We Throw Away Are Diamonds, A Refugee's Search for Home. And our moderator for today's panel is Fairfield University writing professor Sonia Huber, whose latest book, Voice First, A Writer's Manifesto, was just released. Please welcome our panel. All right. Well, I am excited to hear from all of you about your work. So I'm going to start with a softball question, which is, uh, tell us a little bit about how activism either appears in or inspires your work. And whoever wants to go can jump in. Okay. Hey, my name is Monja Dogon, as Kerry said. I'm so happy to be here today. I think I grew up in Democratic Republic of the Congo, one of the dangerous places, the most dangerous place on the planet. So I grew up there, and when I turned three years old, the genocide uh, that was happening in Rwanda against the Tutsi spilled over into Congo. I I'm from Tutsi family, so my Tutsi family, myself including my family, so we moved from Congo, went to Rwanda, and I spent my entire life in refugee camp. So being in refugee camp for my entire life, and also being a child soldier at the age of 10, staying there, seeing what was happening in Congo and during the genocide in Rwanda, it motivated me to say, hey, I want to say this. I want to make sure I do my part to stop this. So grew, growing up in refugee camp and surviving genocide and, and massacres, it, it pushed me to you know, write. So I wrote when I was in refugee camp. I wrote because I, I felt connected to the you know, a lot of refugees all over the world. I've never been to Ukraine, I've never been to Syria, I've never been to Afghanistan, but I believe that their journeys are very exotic to the one I took in 1996 when I fled Congo all the way to Rwanda. I think that's why that activism was part of my work since I was young. All right, we'll go down the line. My name is Hugh Ryan. I'm the author of The Women's House of Detention. Uh, and it's an interesting question because I think so much of my work as a queer historian directly relates to the activism I've done in my life. Uh, I'm interested in histories that have been suppressed and oppressed officially and thinking through how we find them and how we tell them. So when I learned about two facts that were kind of really important to doing this book for me, one was I did a tour of the West Village by uh, an older lesbian who told me that she had been incarcerated there in a 12-story maximum security prison that stood in the heart of Greenwich Village for 50 years and that this was a mostly forgotten story uh, and that in fact the reason she gave these tours was because kids today didn't know it anymore and she felt like her entire world had disappeared when the prison had been destroyed. So. After that, I felt I had to tell this story. And then when I started digging into the current situation, I discovered that today, in America, 40% of people in women's prisons identify as LGBTQ. Oh, wow. 40%. And that holds true when we look at detention centers for girls as well. 40% of the kids in girls' detention centers are queer, and we never talk about it. 
So that's what motivated me to write this book. And then through writing the book, I, of course, met so many more activists, uh, particularly around prison abolition, that really evolved my thinking and changed my thinking about prisons through listening to the work that I'm doing. So my activism kind of goes in both ways. I look for these histories, and then I learn from these histories. I'm Gwendolyn Keist. I write mostly horror fiction and horror nonfiction, and Really, one of the things I'm always focused on is having more female voices and more queer voices. So when I'm writing my nonfiction, really trying to find those authors that you know are feminist horror writers and then queer horror writers, and then in my own work, you know, incorporating those powerful female voices, reclaiming women's voices, and then also you know including queer characters because growing up, you know. As a bisexual girl, there really wasn't a lot of bisexual characters in literature, or they were always bad, or they were always confused. And so it's like really trying to find those kind of characters and create those kind of characters, or focus on the writers who have been writing those characters that sometimes go out of print, or we don't focus enough on those stories. And so really trying to find those places, both in my horror fiction and in my nonfiction. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Phillips. Uh, I'm very excited to be sitting here among these brilliant authors. I wrote a book called Disappearing Earth that I would like to classify as a literary thriller. So it's about two young girls who go missing in Russia and how that affects the community around them, the community of women and girls around them. I uh, set that book in Russia, but the inspiration for it was very American, very domestic. I had spent about 10 years volunteering, first volunteering for and then working for an organization that supports survivors of violence in emergency rooms in New York City, and uh, specifically survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. And that work um, was without a doubt the most educational mm, responsibility of my entire life. It, it was uh, work that taught me so much about my community and my neighbors and myself and helped me understand the assumptions I was carrying with me about how violence operates mm -hmm. and how we can protect ourselves from it, which I then came to learn is, is a fallacy. You know, like violence is not our decision. It is somebody else's decision. Somebody else hurts us. Mm -hmm. And there's not a way that we can behave or a person that we can be that keeps us safe from that. And that understanding um, was entirely informed by that, that volunteering and then that working and uh, I think profoundly shaped the book, the story, and um, the kind of art I want to make in the world. I, I think it really changed. I think it helped me see that I had learned a certain kind of story. Uh, and in fact, the lives that we live don't reflect that story. They, they um, have a different truth to tell. And so, and so I want my work to try to reflect that truth, too. Hi, I'm Luke Quiet, the author of Jackson and the upcoming Vanessa Jarrett's Got a Man. Um, when I was about 16 years old, I started reading um, romance, specifically Harlequin Presents category romance. And after reading them for about two and a half years or so, I realized that I never saw anyone that looked like me on the pages, on the covers. Um, I never read about places that I had actually been to as a 16-year-old growing up in Brooklyn. Um, and I, I didn't understand the impact of that at that time, being so young. But as I began uh, to uh, going to college, getting older, experiencing more in the world, I, I really began to understand that what those stories were saying collectively was your absence means that you are not worthy of love, that people that look like you and live like you are not worthy of love. And so I decided I wanted to sort of um, rebel against that lie. <laughs> and so I started writing romance. I didn't think that it would become something um, so significant, but, but it really, in pursuing my goal to become um, a romance author, I started to see that it was much more about not just, it was much more, there was much more to it than just getting on the page. It was also the problems of trying to actually break into the industry. Like there was so much anti-blackness 
in romance that it's almost an impossibility as a black author, especially a black author that's writing about plus size women, to get into the business and be successful at it. Um, I have been fortunate <laughs> in my perseverance of it, um, of pursuit of that goal, but it's taken a lot of advocacy. I had to really take on the role in the industry as someone who would be known for speaking out against a lot of the, what I call our subtle instances of racism in publishing, um, you know, and, and working hard with publishers to sort of create opportunities for black authors writing romance. So I am, you know, writing about love for some people, you know, they think romances are fluff and that they're not really literature and, you know, they're not worthy of study and they, they're not significant in any way. But the truth of the matter is romance is probably one of the largest uh, makes the largest slice of the pie for publishing in terms of money. Uh, last year we made like 1.8 billion, with a B, dollars. <laughs> and so if you have an, a genre that's making that much money, and they're exclusively almost, because romance publishing is probably about 90%, 90 to 98% straight and white, mm -hmm. um, it, it's like you're going up against a machine <laughs> to try to get, to tell your story, to tell people that our love and our lives matter too. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great, that's beautiful. Thank you all so much. So I guess a follow-up that I wanted to ask from all of your uh, responses was, is there a vision or sort of like a stereotype of activism or community and world changing that you're writing against in your work? Oh, definitely. I'm, <laughs> definitely. Um, I am writing against the, the idea that the only way that people can, can connect to black characters is through struggle and strife. Uh, yeah. I despise the struggle story. And it's not that I do not believe struggle should be shared because that brings awareness. But that is not the sum total of our existence. That is not the only thing that we experience. And so my goal is to write about black joy, which you would think is, you know, people would sort of understand and accept, but you would not believe how hard it is for people to sort of get out of that mindset that when they pick up a book that features POC characters or features queer characters, that there's not sadness, that sadness is not the driving force behind the book. So having the the ability to seek joy and, and sort of reveal joy in your own work, that is, I mean, it, it takes a lot of, mm -hmm. of knowing yourself, believing in yourself, believing in what you're writing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to go up against it. I'm going to agree with that 100%. I think so often, you know, we're expected to write certain stories, all of us. Like, it's just this kind of idea of these are the stories that have always been published, and we're expected to just keep kind of repeating that. And I remember I saw a conversation recently on Twitter where an author was saying they, they read three stories recently that were published, and they were all good stories. They were all by different authors, but they could have been written by the same author because we're kind of all expected to be writing the same thing. But... We all have different experiences, and we're not a lot of times, you know, given that that opportunity. Or, you know, if like you said, as as a writer of color, or as you know, a feminist writer or a queer writer, it's like the struggle story is the only thing we're a lot of times allowed to write. We have to suffer, and it's like even if you want to write that type of story, you're still expected to suffer in a certain way. And if you're not like showing that exact kind of like, oh well, this is the way I I suffer, then it's like you know, if you want to make it complicated, if you want these characters that just aren't necessarily you know, maybe not even the most likable. That's okay, too. You don't have to be a likable woman, or, you know, you don't have to be to, to, you know, be deserving of a story. But very often, that's kind of what is expected. Like, okay, well, we're going to let you in the door, but only if you write this certain story. And that's, like, really limiting all of our voices and literature. I mean, we don't need the same stories over and over again. So, yes, I definitely agree with that so, so much. I... Uh, Excuse me. I also agree with them. I think 
when I started writing as a guy who grew up in refugee camp the entire lives, mm -hmm. I had a lot of limitation. My people and the lives, myself and the people, the lives of people around me, we had a lot of and these kind of uh, invisible pain. Many of the people I grew up with, they are survivors, orphans, widows. One of my friend uh, uh, who was born, I think in 2000, her mom, he, his mom wa was impregnated by her rapist and the guy grew up there and her mom was not feeling comfortable to say what happened to her when she was in Congo. And all the time I felt sorry for this guy, all the time. and. Um, for education, I studied under my education under the tree in refugee camp. I think some of you, you have never been refugee camp. And uh, I studied my education under the tree. We didn't have classrooms. My teachers were not qualified. So I didn't have pen or notebook. So we studied under the tree. And when it rained, uh, we went back home and we came the next day. So that when you live in refugee camp, you feel kind of disconnected from the world. So the refugee camp where I was, I grew up, so there was a fence. So we were not, we didn't have connection between refugees as refugees and host community in Rwanda. So all the time when I finished high school, I was the top, one of the top student in the entire country in Rwanda. So I would not be able to be given financial aid to go to college. So when I went to college, when I, Somebody sponsored my education. I tried to knock. I went to the best school in the country. Nobody supported me because they say, hey, he's a refugee, things like that. And also, beside education, they had a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, stigma we refugees had. I say, hey, I need to break through. People see refugees as people who don't have potential. So I want to show the world that it's different. So I met the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, say, I read your book and I see what you do because I moved you from refugee camp to another camp to collect stories of war, rape, and hope. And most of these stories, are, I published them in refugee camp. We, do, we didn't have publishers. So I wrote this story. I hid the names of the people who shared me their name, their stories. So I published it everywhere in refugee camps. And this helps these people to heal. And also the government of Rwanda, the UN, they started realizing that, you know, what they think or what they thought was different. I think mm -hmm. we write for the reason, and it was fighting against this stereotyping. I think one thing I try to push back against in my work is this idea that prison abolition is a pie in the sky or impossible dream. I think of it as deeply practical and as Mariam Kaba says, the floor of our demands, not the ceiling. Because one thing that you learn when you look at prisons historically is that they have very little to do with justice or rehabilitation. What they function as are drains, they're, they're catch basins, right? I used to say that prisons were broken, but they're not. They're monstrously efficient, but what they do is is they take up everyone that we don't care for through all the other broken systems. So, so long as our welfare system, our education system, our housing, our hospital, our mental health systems are broken, we will have people who will fall through those cracks. And those people we put in jail, regardless of what they have done or haven't done. And so long as jails exist, we will never fix those other systems because the jail provides the fallback, the safety, the catch-all for the people we refuse to care for. And that's how it connects for me to my queer politics because in America, we have a country that believes that care comes from the nuclear family primarily. And the government is simply there to help heterosexual nuclear families and now more uh, families who are gay married, right? But so many queer people do not live in vertical families that provide those kinds of care. And there will always be queer people in need of care. And if our systems of care are starved and prison becomes the only one that we can all depend on ending up in eventually, queer people end up in prison. And so for me, I don't think prison reform is a possibility, at least not without a goal of abolition. Abolition is the starting place. It is the practical demand. It is the way forward not some imaginary dream that we will never reach. It is a necessary goal that we have to figure out how to get to. Okay. All right, so one of the most important things about activism to me is the fact that it's never an individual, it's always about community. And so I was wondering if 
uh, each of you could talk a little bit about how your readers have helped you develop as a writer. That's an awesome question. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, starting as a reader of romance and getting to read people like Rochelle Allers, the late Francis Ray, um, uh, Brenda Jackson, Sandra Kitt, as well as Zane. You know, reading those authors really sort of shaped my idea of what romance looked like for women that looked like me. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I remember reading Zane's Shame on It All, and I could see my mother and her sisters as the main characters. Like, I'd heard, I'd heard those conversations, I'd experienced um, that sort of family situation that was going on in that book. And it, I connected to that book in a way that I don't think I had ever really before that connected to a book. And that was always, that's always my goal when I'm writing. I write so that black women will read my books and see that familiarity. They'll recognize themselves in the book. But I also write so that non-black people will read the books and get to experience culture, get to experience who we are outside of the very narrow scope of who we're allowed to be in the public sphere. Yeah. Writing can be such a solitary pursuit to begin with. So I think writers can be isolated so easily. So I do like bringing up the fact that readers do provide us a sense of community. I'm not sure I ever even thought about it that way, but yet I feel like I always kind of understood it because I feel like that is so important. Because sometimes it feels like you're screaming into a void as a writer. You kind of sit there and you're like, is this gonna work for anybody but me? <laughs> and then if you get it to the editor and they seem to get it, you're like, okay, at least it worked for two people. <laughs> at least two people understood this. You know, but then when you have that feedback from readers that just, you know, really communicate that they get it, that they got it, and that it mattered to them. That's that moment that you're like, okay, it, it was worth it. And sometimes it's like, even if you only have a few people who say that, you know, like you're, you're waiting for a book to come out or it's just come out, that, that can be so much. It can, like you said, it's that, that community of like, okay, I'm not alone and what I'm writing about does matter and it is important to keep speaking and to keep writing. You know, and then also hopefully, you know, as, as, a, as a writer, encouraging other writers and having that community with other writers and being able to all be together and say, hey, you know, this is important. What we're saying does matter and it does make, make a difference. And so, yeah, definitely. It's such a strange thing in writing that mix of, of loneliness and necessary community. Necessary isolation and necessary community. I, I wanted to be a writer my whole life, be an author my whole life. It was always my dream. And I had this fantasy that I think was from movies or maybe like a postcard I had once seen of John Updike. I don't know. <laughs> that, that there was sort of like this kind of 1950s middle-aged white guy like sitting at a typewriter and a desk and he would sit down at nine and get up at five and like smoke cigarettes and that's how books were written. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, I didn't quite know how to do that, uh, make that. I didn't, I didn't know how to translate my own life into that life. And it was extraordinary to me that when the dream I had held for so long of publishing a book, you know, like the dream of holding your book, when that started to come true, to look around and think how, how not isolated that experience was, mm -hmm. um, that it was such a collective effort from the start mm -hmm. and a, a community effort. And it was a community effort, I, I think you can say, of readers in that like people who, readers in the way that we're all readers, not only when we're reading, but also like people who care about books or show up for each other or what you're doing here right now or the ways that we talk to each other, though, like the, that we've never met before, but we have points of connection between us mm -hmm. because we care about this thing of storytelling. And there were so many people through my life that I was like, you know, I don't know, teachers or friends or my peer writing group or um, people who I didn't s recognize at the time as being essential to 
art making because they weren't in that postcard picture in my head, you know? And, and I see now how, um, how collective the effort is of making art all the time, and especially putting art into the world. Like, not only coming up with our own stories, but having the faith, keeping the faith that those stories are worthwhile, I think is very much a community effort for all of us all the time. And I, and I have, and it's really informed uh, the way in the past few years I try to recognize our role in that community of, of readers, of, and readers meaning like people who keep the faith, you know, who say like, I believe, I believe in your story, I believe in your story, and I believe it, it matters. I think one of the great things about telling um, hidden and suppressed stories is that over and over again, I get emails from readers who have been looking for that same okay. story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with my new book, it's often women in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who say to me, I have never seen this part of my life represented in print before. Mm -hmm. uh, with my last book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, it's a history of Brooklyn from the 1850s up to the 1970s, and I still get emails from people who say, that was my grandmother. I never knew this about her. That was my great uncle. Uh, and not only is that a amazing to hear as a writer, but they fill me in with so many details that I could never have in any other way. And I get to help them shepherd those things that they now understand are precious into archives where they can get shared with other people. Uh, so that has been like truly just phenomenal and a, an extension of my work that I never expected to have. Yeah, for me, when I start writing, as I said, uh, in refugee camp, we, when I grew up in refugee camp, 90% of my people, they didn't go to school. So what they had to do was to listen to what I said. So I remember I was in fourth grade when I started writing poems. Mm. And I narrated a poem to my people. There was more than 100 people surrounding my tent refugee camp. So the story I talked about or the poem I wrote was about the life of refugee camp. So that connected me more with these people where they felt, hey, we didn't go to school, and we expect to stay here in refugee camp short time. They expect to stay there temporarily, but when you live in refugee camp for 20 years, you say, hey, I think we need to figure out the other way we can try to survive rather than, you know, when you, for any refugee all over, all over the world, when you flee your home, you think you're going to stay there maybe in, for temporary reasons and come back to your country. And at least there you have hope. But when it comes in like five years, 10 years, a lot of things start changing. So the only weapon that can help them to process the healing was writing. So I wrote them and a lot of people, I wrote what happened to them without mentioning their names. And that connected me to them because we didn't have a library of refugees still. Now, beside the library I built in refugee camps in Rwanda, so we didn't have a library. So I built the library, or I, I, I wrote stories, I share stories among refugees. They read for those people who can read, but those who can't, I narrated the stories and the poems and things like this. I think it was more, it created writing and reading, created more connection between me and my communities, mm. I mean refugees. Mm. Um, so I was wondering if you, each of you could tell me a little bit about a book that's been really inspiring to you when it comes to the vision of activism and community engagement and however you're doing it. I can say when I was young, I speak French. So my dad speak French. Before then, my dad in Congo as a Congolese guy born in Congo. So my dad was a well-respected chief of village where we had Belgian people come all the way when they want to extract minors to take to Europe. So, and so my dad, my mom, everybody, they speak French. So I grew up reading French books uh, as I, my basic education was in French. And uh, so when I, uh, when I went to Rwanda, so it was French and a little bit English that time. And um, uh, so when I, I was in Rwanda in refugee camp, uh, what I did was, you know, to be there and listen to my mom. So my dad started getting old, old. He's now 75. My mom is 65. So they were very, very old, and I'm, I'm the oldest in the family. So I think what I, I uh, what I did was, hey, I say, nobody's there in refugee camp. Uh, nobody is gonna save what I, 
so what my people is going through. And I decided to create something kind of a group, a group of, a, a group of people where uh, we can all meet together and share stories. Mm -hmm. And so when I get back to what was your question, I want to give what what was your question? I want to can oh, you repeat the question? It's about so, a, a book that's been very important. So I read the book. So uh, there was a country called South Africa. It was, uh, I think everybody knows Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. So the book that inspired me after going through all those difficulties and limitation in a refugee camp, I came across a book called No Easy Walk to Freedom. Mm -hmm. No Easy Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela that talked about apartheid. So that motivated me to you know, say, hey, he did it and I can do it. After 27 years in prison, I think, no, never say never in life. Mm -hmm. I think for me it would have to be Sandra Kitt's um, The Color of Love. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that Miss Kitt, um, this was her intention when she wrote the book, mm -hmm. uh, but it was the first interracial romance I'd ever read. Mm -hmm. And it, it was very strange going from reading romance for so long, not seeing someone that looked like me, and having that subliminal message reinforced that you're not lovable, um, to reading Miss Kitt's book and coming to the conclusion that, wow, not only are we lovable, but everybody loves us. <laughs> everybody loves us. And then I thought, I need to write like this. Yeah. I, I, I need to write like this and show that everyone yeah. loves us. Oh. So I adore that book and still do to this day. <laughs> I would say Miriam Kaba's We Do This Till We Free Us. I just think it is one of the best, most clear-eyed, easy-to-read explanations of prison abolition today. Uh, and I think everyone should read it. It's fabulous. Uh, I read a... I'm embarrassed to say I'm sitting here racking my name for the author's... I'm racking my brain for the author's name and can't remember it. But it was a novel called So Much Pretty that I read a few years ago. I don't know if anyone else has read it. Um, and I was totally blown away by this novel because it was, I think, the first book I had read that um, where the author put her whole self on the page. And she wasn't leaving parts out to be cleaner or, or more presentable or more palatable or more... Um, it was just a really ferocious, um, gutting, moving, impactful book of someone whose name I can't remember. Isn't that awful? <laughs> but Carol, Carol oh, thank you, Kara Hoffman. Okay, yes. Oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um, I, it really was. I think changed a lot for me in the way I thought about what books can do and the way I thought of uh, what, to be honest, I think what I could do, you know, to, 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 to see someone tell a story in the way you want to tell a story, and you didn't even know that you wanted it until yeah. you see it. So I'm a horror writer, so my answer might seem a little weird, but bear with me here. <laughs> The book that I like, as soon as you said that, the first one that came to mind for me was Men, Women, and Chainsaws by Carol Clover. And the reason is because I remember I was in graduate school for psychology and I was, we had to, you know, write a paper and I decided to write it about feminism and horror. And that was always something that it always was like, you know, I always felt that it was like, you couldn't be a horror fan and a feminist. It was always like, oh, if you like horror, then you don't like women. And I always thought that's ridiculous, and that's never how I felt. And then I found this book, and it was like, you know, it was, a, it was not a new book at the point when I was in grad school, but I'd never come across it. And it was really all about that nexus of gender and horror, and really exploring, you know, the final girl and slasher movies and the feminism in it. And I remember I turned in that paper and my, my professor, I think they were just like, please just finish your degree and leave. <laughs> you are such a weirdo. They gave me, she gave me like an A, she gave me like an A minus. And I'm like, I know there's an emphasis on that minus, but that's fine. <laughs> and I remember I finished the degree and then I'm 
like, don't think I'm going to stay in academia, but I think I'm going to really kind of go more into horror. <laughs> and it was really because of that book of like giving me this, this space to be able to be both and not have to be like, oh, well, you can be a feminist, but you can't be a horror fan, or you can be a horror fan, but not a feminist. I'm like, that seems so ridiculous and, and you know, reduces me so much. And so, yeah, that's, that's it. Men, women, and chainsaws, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think since we have about 10 minutes left, I will open it up to any questions that anybody has. We'll see if that works. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little short. Um, thank you all. I love the panel. Um, I have a question that I feel is very popular when it comes to activism. It's like I wrote it down. Like, how do you walk the line between telling your own story and telling the story of others? Yes. What kind of questions do you have to ask yourself and what things do you keep in mind when telling another person's experiences that you haven't necessarily lived through? I think it's, it's really about first coming from it from a point of respect. Um, I think that's the, the foundation, having respect for other people and their experiences. Um, I think also it's the perspective of authoritative or questioning. Uh -huh. Are you coming to this asking questions, admitting that you don't know it all mm -hmm. and that you're trying to learn? Mm -hmm. Or are you trying to stipulate that this is the way it is because you say so? Mm -hmm. And I think if you can sort of come to, when you're writing the other, if you come to it with the idea of, one, I'm writing human beings. Mm -hmm. I'm not writing a particular kind of human being. I'm writing human beings. And then two, let me have respect for this person's possible experiences and their culture and everything else that makes them up. I think you, not that you can't stumble, but I think you end up writing a book that is more respectful and less problematic that way. When um, I, I have two pieces of writing that I, I recommend on this slide. I lost you, there you are, okay. I was like, you're no longer at the microphone. Um, one is a Caitlin Greenidge essay in the New York Times, I think called Who Gets to Write What? Mm -hmm. And one is a, a recent Zadie Smith essay in the London Review of Books, uh, I think called on, Daring to Presume, like the Art of Writing Fiction. And those, I think they're both really um, subtly done craft essays and they talk about <laughs> they talk about that thing that is so tough which is like if it's very 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 well done then it's worth doing and it's exciting and to read and and it feels right but then when it doesn't feel right it feels like so hurtful and wrong and how hard to be like do it just do it very well you know or like <laughs> don't do it if you can't do it well it, that that's a what a difficult thing um, i think when we come to the page where when we come to the page it, al it always is bad when we start um, <laughs> the, the stories that we're starting um, and uh, and i really like to read those essays and to read those and to think about the work that i think um, does well and very much like starts, operates from a place of um, like curiosity and clarity about the world, seeing clearly and, um, and what doesn't. I, I think it is, I think it helps us a lot as people to reflect on as people and as artists, to reflect on these questions. <laughs> I'll echo what both of you said. I think that's both of those answers are, are so good. And I love how you talk about, you know, really coming from a place of respect and how, how really, really important that is. And I would also just add that no matter how much you do try, you might fail, at least for some readers. And that's what, you know, nobody's a monolith, right? So there's no way of pleasing every single reader and realize that what might work so well for, for one group of readers, another group of readers is going to be like, I, yeah, I find this problematic. I find it offensive. And as the writer, you know, being able to live with that dichotomy and also try to learn from it, you know, maybe, maybe you really did do something that you could have done better, you know, be willing and open to getting better. But at the same time, also recognize you're never going to be able to please everybody. And if you do come from that place of, of respect and trying your best and, and learning, 
but that's, you know, you're never going to be able to please all readers. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm greedily jumping back in, Hugh. <laughs> 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 Which is to say, I think this, this question is so interesting um, and exciting because I think sometimes we don't tease apart when we're thinking about this or thinking about our, uh, like what are we talking about when we talk about this? I think sometimes we're talking about writing. I think often we're talking about publishing. Mm -hmm. And then often we're talking about publishing and being uh, rewarded for publication. Mm -hmm. You know, like that people would be like, you've done a great job. Mm -hmm. You, you, wow, you really like knocked it out of the park here. Mm -hmm. And I think those things are all different. And, uh, and that they have different barriers to them and they have different, um, like sometimes people get rewarded for publishing things that are not good <laughs> at all. <laughs> and, and sometimes, and like, or a lot of times I feel like writers come to the page being like, I'm not allowed to write when what they mean is, I'm afraid that I won't be report, rewarded to publish. Yes. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and it all, um, it's very interesting. I think for me, working historically, so much of it comes down to treating people as real. Uh, it's so easy, I think, when we look backwards to treat history like a dirty mirror, right? Oh, if only these people weren't so dumb, they would understand everything the way I do. And so I'm going to tell you who they would have been if they were born today. It's this kind of identitarian look that I think is, uh, in, in, in queer history very often, uh, I'll often get asked, well, were they gay or were they trans? You know? And I'm like, mm, they were in the 17th century, none of the above. We can talk about them as the roots of gay and trans history and of the roots of our identities, but I, I'm always working in materialism history. I want to talk about what is an action that someone took that was non-normative for their gender or sexuality of their time. I don't want to then say, and thus they were gay, because that concept doesn't mean anything to them. And it wasn't part of their world. It doesn't help me to understand them. I have to walk in their world, sit with their concepts, think about their ideas, because then through seeing from their identity, I can see how the world functioned for them and then I can share that with us and I can see how the, their world leads into our world. So much of my work is about figuring out the like mm -hmm. angle of uh, impact and the acceleration of history to see where we are headed today. But to do that, I have to stop thinking that I am right all the time and that everything we think is correct and to step into their world, uh, which often just means that a lot of my work is just researching the stuff around the stuff I'm interested in because otherwise I don't understand it. I'll just add to that with respect to identity because I think that's really important. Um, I, and it may not work for every type of writer or every type of genre, but it's very important for me as a writer when I'm writing someone from a different background that I'm not making their identity the struggle, yeah. the conflict. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a real aversion to writing stories where that sort of, where everything that's going wrong in the book is because of that individual's yeah. identity. And I think it's so easy to fall into that trap and, and authors feel like they're telling a compelling, relatable story, mm -hmm. but what they're really saying is, you know, my world is falling apart because I'm black, because I'm LGBTQ+, yeah. plus, mm -hmm. because I'm, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that is why I can't have whatever it is I want in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. It's all about being respectful. I remember, so I got the opportunity last, I think 2019, I got the opportunity to, to go to Istanbul, Turkey, to, mm. do, to write paper, to do research with the UN. So when I got there, it was very, very interesting because the way I wrote my book, it might be my a novel or a, mem a memoir, it was different uh, about writing these UN research. So I think it's all about being respectful and respect people's culture, identity, and also values. Some of the countries have values. I think you're not gonna be, I think all the time there will be critique all the time. You can't, you can't get, you know, A plus when you're a writer. You will be all, all the time, you'll be criticized. You'll be, you'll be criticized not because your work was not good, but because sometimes you touch someone's feeling, somebody you didn't know in a way that it was kind of intentional. So be there, do the best, and 
mm. love what you do with respect and mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I have a question about standing up for your activism issues in public. I remember seeing tweets by Gwendolyn uh, right after the Roe v. Wade reversal supporting women's rights, which is one of the things that <clears throat> had us ask her to do the introduction to the horror anthology we put together <laughs> called A Woman Unbecoming, uh, which benefits reproductive health care. Um, how do you all feel about standing up in public when it's so easy to target someone for the slightest little thing. Is it something that you have a concern about, about your certain issues? <laughs> My mouth is reckless <laughs> by nature. <laughs> it is a Brooklyn thing. Um, my mouth is reckless by nature, and I, I, I do speak for what I feel. I mean, Romancelandia may love me or hate me. But I'm really polarizing one way or the other. Um, people usually have strong feelings about me and what I say you know, on either side. Um, but I think for me, it's always about being true to what mm -hmm. I believe in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I don't rah rah sis boom ba for everything that's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. But um, especially when it's something that I feel really touches us as a whole, mm -hmm. it's something that I, I have to speak on. Mm -hmm. And so if I feel moved enough and compelled enough to speak, then I'm going to speak. I know my publishers would probably wish I'd shut up sometime. <laughs> but it's not always, I know my husband, he tells me, I have a book coming out in like a week and a half. Vanessa Jarrett will be out. And he literally just said to me, stay off social media. No. <laughs> Don't say anything. Don't come to the defense of anyone. No. We need this book to sell. <laughs> Tell him all publicity is good publicity. <laughs> like, I'm selling that book. <laughs> I was just going to say, social media for me is actually the really tricky part. I have no problem talking about everything I believe in, and I think that is necessary. But I think social media, and particularly Twitter, is evil. Is. And is actually developed to create fights it and is. to yes. make the most stupid versions of things. Because mm -hmm. you cannot have a complex idea in whatever 144 characters. Yeah. Right. It is built to make us say stupid things yes. flippantly while fighting with other people, and in a voice that is meant to talk to our closest friend, our mother, someone we've never met, and someone all the way across the world. Those aren't the same context. So I actually try to avoid speaking in general on social media. I hate it. I just, I don't think it helps almost ever. There are circumstances where it does. I understand that it connects people who will never be able to find each other in other ways. I understand all of these great parts to it. But I actually think that social media activism, when done in an unconsidered way, just ups the volume, the heat, and makes us feel awful. When I get into fights online, I spend the rest of the day walking around wanting to fight and feeling like <laughs> yeah. my adrenaline is up here, you know? And I'm not sure I've helped anything. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's social media for me is the really hard part, not the speaking up. It's that so much of our lives are now we are expected to channel them through social media. And if we do not comment on something on social media, then that means we don't care about it. Yes. And that yes. drives me nuts. Yes. It is evil. You're yes. absolutely right. Yes. <laughs> I, I so completely agree with that. I, I think, um, like, how lucky are we to get to be sitting here with microphones in front of us talking to you all? This is quite extraordinary. And. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I would love that, and I like, and also when I go to a panel for any genre, any time, like, what a waste of time it would be if the person who's sitting there with the microphone doesn't say what they actually have to say and doesn't say something they think is worthwhile. You know, mm -hmm. like, what is the what's the point if you get to, if you get to have the microphone, and who knows how long you have it? Yeah. What's the point of of using it to say anything that's a that's a waste of time. You know, something that is not true or that doesn't reflect your values or that is not something you think is important to say. And I think sometimes that, for me, that means saying what I think, uh, what I believe. And sometimes, for me, that means not talking. Yeah. Because um, I've had uh, enough experience on the internet. Uh, the internet came into my life when I was... Uh, 
too irresponsible to know how to use it. <laughs> which, by which I mean middle school. Uh, and that was a formative experience in the fact that it can add a lot of pain to one's mm -hmm. life. And, uh, it, and so now I think one of the important things you can do is if you think there's something that really matters, like add less noise, do more work, you know what I mean? Yes. Like just yes. shut up and, and move your feet. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that has been an important part of this for me to, to say what I wanna say when I wanna say it. And then the rest of the time, like do, do the work. Yep. Yeah. And I really love how both of you have actually just brought up the fact that like sometimes not speaking on social media and listening and learning. There have been so many things that have come up over the last few years that I'm like, listen, I don't have enough knowledge or enough experience or this is not a place where it's even I feel my right to speak. And it's like sometimes that silence then is viewed as, oh, I don't care. And it's like, no, I'm, I'm really trying to learn. And I'm actually try trying to do the work of not being like, oh, well, you all need to know my opinion on this. Like, I can assure you like, there are many, <laughs> yeah, there are many situations situations that people do not need my opinion on. And so it's like, I think that that balance of really trying to say, you know, when do I need to speak and when do I need to listen? And when is it just like, this is not about me, this is about me learning from, from other people. And I do love how you say that social media can be so evil, especially Twitter, because it does get people into fights. And a lot of times the loudest voices that are like, the most isolating for people and cause the most problems are the ones that get the loudest and get the most amplification. And that is so scary. You know, I just try to balance it as much as possible, trying to be kind and trying to be supportive of others. But if something comes up, like you said, that you do feel like you need to speak about, speak about it, you know? It might get you in trouble sometimes, but it's better to speak about the things that, that really matter. But again, like you said, balancing it, that it's not just, you know, I'm just getting into a fight with people, because you're right. I, I try not to get into fights with people on the internet. Like, I'm like, if I'm gonna get into a fight with somebody, I want it to be in person. I want us to be looking at each other, and if we wanna yell at each other, that's fine, but like then it's at least for real. On the internet, I'm always like, this is kind of cowardly. I can just log off when I'm done. Like, come on. Like, <laughs> but you know, but trying to balance that kind of being kind, being supportive, but also being vocal about the things that you need to do and you know, not have it just be that kind of performative activism either. I, I have met people in my life that are just like, oh, these performative activists, I'll take a picture at a protest, but in my day-to-day -day life, I'm not doing any of the work that needs to be done to make the world a better place. And it's like, those type of people frustrate me. So, you know, so just trying to, you know, do your best and, and show kindness when applicable, hopefully, and also getting mad sometimes. Being angry isn't bad, especially with how bad the world has gotten, you know? It's okay to be angry sometimes. <laughs> um, Hugh, you mentioned something earlier about your previous book uh, about the history of Brooklyn and how uh, uh, family members would reach out to you regarding things that they read. And it made me curious, and, and this is kind of a general question for everybody, but that, that notion of the book is done, the book is published, the book is, your, your involvement with this moment is, has, in essence, kind of come to a close, but there's still more story to be told or more history to be kind of shared. And you mentioned archives, but I'm curious, like, is there ever an opportunity for the story to kind of progress further? Like, is there a continuation or an evolution of, of the work that you've done? And where does it go once it, the book is finished? Mm. I'm lucky because I only really write about one thing. I've been writing about New York City's queer history for like 20 years. I also started a museum about it for a while. Like, I, if I find a story, I just keep going at it. I'm dogged. I don't have a lot of creativity or imagination. So it helps to have one subject. Uh, but it does. Things do come up again. I mean, that's what I love about my work is that everything I do feels like it builds on the piece before. Yes. When I wrote that first book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, for instance, I found records of the sort of first person that I could point to in Brooklyn Brooklyn's history who had an understanding of himself as a trans man that was very much like our modern understanding of what it means to be a trans man. He was arrested in 1913 for wearing pants and smoking in a bar in Brooklyn. Uh, and he disappears, unfortunately, from the records that I was able to find at that time. I saw that he was arrested. I knew that he went to a reformatory. I knew his birth name, but I didn't know the name that he lived under. I found the letters he wrote to Woodrow Wilson, President Wilson requesting the right to wear the clothes he wanted to wear and be addressed the way he wanted to be addressed, but the rest of his life was a mystery to me. 
And when I started doing the research for the new book, it just didn't even occur to me that I might come across his records. But I was going through these uh, social work files with these people who worked with formerly incarcerated um, women, non-binary folks, and trans men, though they understood them as women, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and I found a 400-page file containing the rest of his life. I found the name that he lived under, I found the names of his family, I found where he was buried, I found the newspaper clipping from when he was murdered by a John because he was a sex worker, which I hadn't known in the original part. So the story for me kept going and I found it by accident, but so often that's the way that my work actually works is that I find part of a story and six years later I find the rest of it, or 10 years later. So I'm constantly returning to the same things and writing a a deeper or more nuanced version of them. Did you do a chapbook of that? I mean, literally, did you uh, out their story? He's, he's in both books. Uh, Big Cliff Trondle is his name, if you want to find out more about him. He had a fascinating and incredible life. <laughs> I, I love that cue so much. I'm thinking about, I, I mean, I wonder, I feel like it's presumptuous to state what I think but this is what I think. But I'll, I'll put it as a I'll put it as a question to all of you. Um, do you feel that you have a subject that you just continue to write into over and over? Are you, like that you have like one obsession or some obsessions that you just continue to write into? Because I feel like we write about we're just writing the same story. <laughs> Absolutely. I every heroine I write is a black woman that's living her fabulous best life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is quite frankly what I write. And so I, I, I get these reviews that always make me laugh because readers will pick it up and can tell it's a reader that's not familiar with my work. And they're like, oh, I thought this you know, was gonna be, like Vanessa Jarrett's Got a Man is about a woman who was in an emotionally abusive relationship for almost two decades. And, but the book is not about her emotional abuse. The book is about this next phase of her life mm -hmm. where she's learning to love herself, learning to open herself up to love again. Mm -hmm. And it's all about her finding joy. Mm -hmm. And there were readers who were really were mad <laughs> that I wasn't you know, putting her abuse <laughs> on the page for them to experience. And I don't write trauma porn, it's not my thing. I, I mean, I'm not knocking anyone who does, mm -hmm. But for me, my purpose in writing is to celebrate loving black women and having them be happy. And because in the, in the media, we don't get to be portrayed as happy. Mm -hmm. It is very rare that you see black women just existing and minding their black lives <laughs> and minding their business. Like you, you don't get to see that very often. And so for me, I'm normalizing, my, my goal is to normalize black women mm -hmm. having joy and just being regular human beings without all of the trauma of life being put on their shoulders. All right, I wanted to thank all of you so much for your wonderful contributions. It was wonderful to meet you all. Thanks for the great questions, y'all.